So to start with, we're going to have a little look at tail dragging theory. Uh, this isn't taught particularly well uh, on most conversions, and so hopefully you'll find something in it that's of value to you. Well, first of all, what's the difference between a nose wheel aircraft and a tail wheel aircraft? In the air, they're both essentially the same. The interesting bit takes part on the ground. For a tail dragging aeroplane, it's invariably more unstable in yaw and indeed in pitch. A lot of these older aircraft are quite neutrally stable, have fairly poor handling qualities, and on the ground, because the nose is up in the air, you can't see where you're going. Right, first of all, we'll review what we're going to have a look at about flying tail draggers. We're going to look at the dynamics of tail wheel aircraft, why they behave as they do. We're going to look at the causes of swing, their handling techniques, and just a short bit on the airliness requirements for crosswind handling of aircraft. Unfortunately, I'm fresh out of model Tiger Moth, so we'll have to make do with this model Gypsy Moth. So what is it that makes the aircraft stand on its backside, or put its tail down, compared with a nose wheel aeroplane? The centre of gravity being after the main wheels, the tail comes down and it rests on its tail skid. If its centre of gravity was in front of the wheels, then it would be nose heavy, hand comes in, and obviously it would want to sit down on its nose. So that's the quintessential distance between the centre of gravity and wheel position for a nose wheel aeroplane or a tail dragging aircraft. It's this that gives rise to its slightly unusual handling performance. Well, when the aircraft touches down with a nose wheel aeroplane, the centre of gravity being forward of its point of contact, the aircraft tries to pitch down or derotate. When the aircraft derotates as the nose wheel drops, then the angle of attack of the wings reduces and hence the lift reduces. The aircraft is considerably less likely to bounce than if it is configured as per a tail dragger. Conversely, with the tail dragger, if the aircraft lands with any rate of descent and yet it still has flying speed, then the, there is a reaction from the wheel pushing up, the centre of gravity wants to go down and hence the aircraft pitches up. As the aircraft pitches up it increases the angle of attack in the wing, increases the lift and the aircraft wants to bounce. So for this reason it's important that the aircraft is either landed in a fully stalled three-point attitude with, which means that both main wheels and the tail wheel touching the ground together at the same time or if the aeroplane is going to be wheeled on and there's a tendency for this tail to descend then as the main wheels touch down you need to check forward very slightly with the stick to prevent this angle of attack from increasing otherwise invariably the aircraft if it's still at flying speed will bounce back off the ground and that gives you the position of rapidly decaying airspeed and the nose high not a good situation and one that needs remedying quickly with power, burst of power with the throttle to hold the aircraft and hold the air attitude to cushion it back onto the ground. So for this reason the nose wheel aircraft is much easier generally to land than the tail dragging aircraft. So that was the aircraft in pitch. Now have, let's have a look at the aircraft slowing down and why the aircraft has a propensity to what's called ground loop or you lose control in your during the rollout. With this being the direction of travel of the aircraft we have the main undercarriage on the ground of a tail dragger but with the tail off the ground. You can see there is a mean point of contact which is represented by the black dot there halfway between the two wheels over the imaginary axle line. Meanwhile its centre of gravity which is also the centre of inertia is behind the wheels hence it's a tail dragger. Conversely with the tricycle undercarriage then the centre of inertia or centre of gravity is in front of the wheels. Obviously that's with the nose wheel off the ground and with the tail wheel off the ground. Right so now let's look at what happens to the aircraft if they're destabilised. In this case we'll imagine there's a gust of wind from the right as to what normally happens during the rollout. So the aircraft has a tendency to yaw to the right as it gets disturbed by the wind. You'll notice how its 
point of contact as it starts to yaw is actually still in the same place between the two wheels on the imaginary axle line. Its centre of inertia has been displaced out to the right. Now remember the aircraft is slowing down now, so there is drag on the wheels, this is during a landing roll, and you can see how the moment of inertia, the weight of the aeroplane, it basically still wants to carry on in the direction it was originally going. So having been displaced to the side, there's actually a writing moment with that moment of inertia pulling to the side of the, the centre of contact and it tries to swivel the aircraft back into line with its direction of travel. So a tricycle is relatively stable on the ground. Conversely, on the left, we have the system for a tailwheel aircraft. This time, as the aircraft yours to the right by the disturbance of wind, the moment the point of inertia is moves out to the side, to the left, and you'll see then it acts as a moment on the axle trying to make it worse. So in a tail dragging aircraft, because of this arrangement here, if you get disturbed one way, it needs positive correction to bring the aircraft back into its original direction of travel. Left unchecked, the aircraft will try and continue its yaw, hence it is unstable. And it's for this reason that ground loops take place. Remembering that the only things available to straighten the aircraft up on most aircraft would be its rudder and brake system. Moths, of course, not having a brake system, the rudder is the only thing that can use to straighten the aircraft out in yaw. And as soon as the speed decays to low speed, there is insufficient airflow over the rudder and the aircraft is unable to uh, correct itself back to the original line. And this is why most ground loops happen at slow speed in tail dragging aircraft. You'll notice that uh, in this diagram here, we have a picture of what it looks like with a tail wheel or tail skid on the ground. And you'll notice that the main point of contact here comes aft towards the centre of inertia. Thus the aeroplane tends to become more stable. <clears throat> For that reason, the control column should be held fully aft such that the load is put on the tail wheel or tail skid, moving the centre of pressure back towards the centre of inertia. This makes the aircraft more stable on the ground. <clears throat> so remember, during the landing roll, it is only the airflow over the rudder and the fin that keeps the aircraft straight, combined with any friction between the tail skid or tail wheel and the ground. It's for this reason that as the aircraft slows, you will need a greater rudder deflection to achieve the same result of keeping it, to keep the aircraft straight. And do not relax until the aircraft finally comes to a halt. It's also for this reason that the aircraft should, if possible, always be operated from grass. The rolling friction between a tail skid and tarmac is very poor. And if possible, avoid runways, and if you do get forced to land on a runway, try to make it as close to wind to wind as possible, and preferably with at least 5 knots or 10 knots of wind down the strip, so that the rudder and fin remain effective you'll be getting very little braking or steering from your tail skid. So that's looking at why the aircraft is unstable during its landing roll and why they have a propensity to ground loop. Let's have a look at the issues of the aircraft taking off. Well, any propeller driven aircraft has a propensity to yaw during the takeoff roll. So I'm sure you've probably looked at these when you did your initial PPL but let's recap on those to clear them up and you'll see their particular relevance with respect to a tail dragging aircraft. Right, the various forces causing a swing. And as we said, any propeller driven aircraft has an inherent tendency to swing or yaw due to the following effects. Slipstream, torque, asymmetric blade effect or what the Americans call P-factor, propeller precession, crosswind and the pilot. So let's have a recap and remember that the moth series of aircraft, the gypsy engines, are what's called left-hand tractor propellers. That means that if we swivel the model round and we look from behind, if we're the pilot sitting in the cockpit and the propeller blade is at the top, if we're looking down there, 
the as the top of the propeller swings to the left in the direction of travel so that's a left hand tractor if the engine went the other way around like americans it would be called a right hand tractor propeller but moths are left hand tractors so because the propeller goes round to the left it doesn't blow the air back in a parallel fashion it actually picks up a rotation around the fuselage so the air comes off underneath the fuselage and then comes up on the other side and pushes on the right side of the rudder and the fin so the air comes out from underneath the fuselage and pushes in the right side of the rudder and the fin and you can see there that it tries to yaw the aircraft to the right so that's the effect of slipstream. The next effect is that of propeller torque. Remembering that everything we have an equal and opposite reaction, the engine is turning the propeller around that way. And that is the effect of trying to roll the fuselage to the right, like that. And as that right hand wheel has more weight on it, it consequently has, creates slightly more drag during the takeoff roll. With more drag on the right wheel, it tends to yaw the aircraft to the right. So that is torque effect. The next thing we're going to have a look at is asymmetric blade effect. Looking at the model from the side, you can see that the propellers obviously at an angle because the aircraft has got its tail down and asymmetric blade effect takes place when the aircraft's tail is down. So as the propeller rotates, you'll find that this downgoing blade not only has its airspeed due to its rotation, the tip, but it's also going very slightly forward in its arc. You can see there's where the blade is at the bottom of its arc. Conversely, there's that about that much gap between the end of the, fuse, uh, end of the screwdriver and the blade at the top. So the blade that's coming down going goes forward a little bit, so it has an increased airspeed and the one coming up from the back has a decreased airspeed. You can think of this in the ultimate point of it that if the aeroplane was a helicopter going forward like that the blade that is going forward is the one that will have the higher airspeed and the retreating blade has the lower airspeed. Of course in reality we're only using a small component of that but the same as the retreating blade on helicopter effect and the advancing blade effect is the same. So that's asymmetric blade effect. And of course with asymmetric blade effect again it's the blade that's on this side that has more thrust, more speed, so that is trying to yaw the aircraft to the right. So the next one we're going to look at is the effect of propeller precession. And the propeller rotating acts just like a gyroscope going around. Now, as we lift the tail up by easing the stick forward, we're effectively pushing a force forward on the propeller blade at the top. You could think of it as a, the opposite of a force down there at the bottom. They need to have the same effect. But if we look at it from the top of the propeller blade, or the propeller arc, the force is going forward, but the way that a gyroscope deals with that, or the effect of it, is it processes it through 90 degrees so it's effectively a force acting on the propeller blade in that position and you can see from there that also tries to yaw the aeroplane to the right so that's propeller precession the more powerful the engine and the uh, more weight there is in the propeller the more you have propeller uh, precession re-effect trying to yaw the aircraft <laughs> Good, eh? He's pretty good.
So we can see that each of those effects tries to yaw the aircraft to the right. And that's why we need left rudder on takeoff with a left hand tractor propeller. If it was the opposite, an American engine going right, you need right rudder. But for the moths, we need left rudder. So what else can destabilise the aircraft during the takeoff roll? Well, obviously, if there's some crosswind, then the aircraft tends to act just like a weathercock. The aircraft tries to, or weather vane, should I say, and tries to yaw into the wind. So if there's a wind from the right, the problem will be even worse, and it will, the aircraft will be more keen to yaw right. Conversely, if the wind is from the left, then the effect of the crosswind on the rudder and the yawing of the aircraft will be to reduce the effects that we've just looked at due to the propeller rotation. One of the other really destabilising effects, it's not so much of a problem on takeoff, but particularly during landing, is pilot induced oscillation, is the pilot themselves. It's very easy when you start off with the aeroplane to uh, put too little control in or too much too late. Just like steering a car when you're starting off or learning to drive a boat, the pilot gets into a pilot induced oscillation in your, just the same as I'm sure you've probably seen it, bouncing the aircraft during landing, getting out of sequence and out of phase with the aircraft in pitch. So. The reason why I say it's um, more difficult in, well, there are good reasons why I say it's more difficult when you're landing. When you're taking off, the secret is to look down the side of the fuselage at the distance and the horizon and see the ground features moving left or right. It's quite easy then to see the nose swinging and put a bit of rudder in. But you've got good propeller wash over the rudder and tail surfaces during your takeoff, so they're very uh, controllable. However, during the landing roll, remember your speed is decreasing to eventually the airspeed being zero. So, as I've said before, the control inputs are actually required to be much greater during the latter stages of the, rolling, of the landing roll than they are at higher speeds. Of course, the design of the aircraft's tail system makes quite a difference to its controllability. Be it a fixed skid, as in the Gypsy Moth, a steerable skid, as in the Tiger. It could be a fully cast ring tail wheel, as in the Chipmunk, or a steerable tail wheel, as used by many of the more modern tail dragging aircraft. Indeed, during the end of the landing roll, or in the start of the takeoff roll, you might need to use some brakes to help keep it straight. But generally, that should be kept to a minimum, with your feet, your heels on the floor, and just the odd touch of brake only once full rudder has been achieved. So when you start off flying your tail dragging aeroplane, what do we need to do? Well, we want to get your head in the right place, the right seating position to start with, such that you've got a good view, but not that your head is outside any protection that the windscreen is uh, going to give you. Your seating wants to be comfortable, cushions appropriately positioned, but we also need to be able to get full rudder travel easily without having to move your hips forward, so that you've got a good seating position and full easy movement of all the controls. One of the main differences you'll see with a tail dragger is that you can't see out of the front on the majority, particularly the moths. So a lot of caution is required on ground handling. That is from starting off to move, have a good look all the way around you. It's quite easy for you to get strapped into an aeroplane and find somebody has come and parked something right in front of you. And that's very embarrassing if you taxi straight forward into it. So before we move, a good look all around, and if you're taxiing in a confined area with an aircraft that's easy to do that, and I don't suggest you do it at all with any braked aircraft, with any unbraked aircraft, always have the aircraft clear of obstacles and taxiing away into a clear area. But if you do have to taxi in something like a chipmunk or the hornet moth or an aeroplane with brakes, be very aware that whether you put the brake on and pivot it on one wheel in a tight turn, the fuselage behind you will swing out and it's very easy to clip an obstacle with the fuselage as you rotate the aircraft around. So be very cautious. You'll notice the view is quite poor and therefore awareness is the key to, the, uh, to safe taxiing. Do not taxi too fast and if there's a strong wind, get somebody on the wing to walk the wings and help you out 
through uh, out to your takeoff position and similarly back in. Once we've got to the main takeoff position and done your checks as you would with an ordinary aircraft, obviously a good look up the approach, good look in front uh, down the takeoff run to make sure it's clear. Always think of doing your emergencies brief. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go if the engine stops? And that will probably be different options at different altitudes. So we line up on the runway and we want to look right down either side of the fuselage at the horizon and pick features, be they trees or buildings, that are either side of the nose that you can use as a reference point to keep the aircraft straight. With your heels on the floor and an appropriate amount of aileron if there's a bit of a crosswind, we smoothly open the throttle. And we open the throttle at a rate that we can keep the aircraft straight with the rudder. A very high powered aircraft may need very gentle opening of the throttle. I should say at this point that the stick should be back such that the tail is being forced onto the ground. So the throttle is smoothly opened and the aircraft starts to accelerate. With something like a moth, by the time it's got to about 10 miles an hour, you'll find that the tail will be wanting to start to lift. So we start progressively bringing the control column forward to the neutral position, or just slightly forward of the neutral position. So get the tail off. As the aeroplane accelerates, you'll find the stick will be back towards the neutral position with whatever aileron is appropriate. With a very high powered aircraft, we must be very careful not to raise the tail too quickly because of that precessionary effect that we uh, talked about, you're in the aircraft. So the rate that we bring the stick forward is appropriate such that we can keep the aircraft straight using the rudder. So we raise the tail to the takeoff attitude and hold that attitude, obviously maintaining the wings level with our ailerons. As the aircraft lifts the off the ground, if there's any crosswind, we neutralise the rudder bar, except the crab angle, uh, we don't want to be one wing down with a low wing aircraft, which is effectively what a moth is, having the lower wings. It's very easy, uh, if you're used to something like a cub, uh, and used to dropping one wing to get one wing, to get your lower wings very close to the ground. So we use the crab technique, both for the takeoff and the landing. And away you fly. And essentially, once in the air, the aircraft is pretty well the same as any nose wheel aeroplane that you may have flown. Right, while we're taking or talking about taking off, there are a couple of errors that we might make. It's really important to get the tail off into the takeoff up into the takeoff attitude. If we were to keep the tail down, then the aircraft starts generating large wind vortices. And these act to break the aircraft and slow it down. Indeed, a moth at maximum all up weight may never acquire flying speed particularly at all up, high all-up weight and close to, uh, sorry, and with high temperatures. So for that reason, we bring the tail off the ground. Similarly, in a high-powered aeroplane that does have the power to pull the aircraft off the ground in a tail-down attitude, we've probably found we're just getting airborne at the stall speed and the controls, particularly in yaw and roll, may be poor. So for that reason, we want to be able to get the aircraft off the ground crisply at the correct flying speed and that's where your correct takeoff attitude is so important. Get your instructor to show you and he should demonstrate that on your first few takeoffs. So now we come to the landing. Well just with every landing, a good landing starts with a good approach. One that's on the correct airspeed and then the correct glide path to where we want to go. Now these tail dragging aircraft are generally designed to land in all, all three points going on at the same time, hence the three point landing. We're looking to land the main wheels and the tail skid onto the ground with the aeroplane fully stalled in a three point landing. The technique we're going to use for that is to fly your normal approach as you would do. We then flare the aircraft just above the ground and unlike the nose wheel aeroplane that you just let it drop on, we're going to progressively ease the control column back as the speed decays such that we hold the aircraft just a few inches off the ground. And that's where the judgement and the skill comes, is holding the aircraft 
just off the ground, six inches or a foot. And you'll find that as the speed decays, which is fairly rapidly in a high drag, draggy biplane, then you'll get to the landing attitude, the aircraft will stall and all three points will drop on together. In fact, a good point there is that to see what that landing attitude is going to look like, before you take off, sit there in the aeroplane and see where the horizon comes in and cuts the aircraft structure. Because that same attitude position and same picture is the three-point attitude that you're looking to achieve when you do your landings. Having said that, the three-point landing, that's very useful for a minimum landing run into a short strip. So short strips, three-point attitude is what's required. Now the moths have relatively poor aileron control. And that's particularly true as the aircraft, if it gets into a three-point attitude, almost stalled in gusty winds or significant crosswinds. And then it may well be more appropriate to wheel the aircraft on in a wheeler landing. So just as before, same approach speed, we bring the aircraft down, flare the aeroplane so there's no rate of descent just above the ground, and then as the main wheels touch, instead of progressively pulling the stick back to hold the aeroplane off the ground, we let the main wheels just grease onto the ground, and at that point check the stick forward a couple of inches just to prevent the tail going down. We can continue to keep the aircraft straight using the rudder at that point and progressively adding into wind aileron if appropriate to stop the wings lifting in a crossed wind. As the speed reduces, air speed reduces you will find that the tail will try to settle. You can ease the stick forward at this point to keep the tail up in the level running attitude for as long as possible. That way you keep the control surfaces of the rudder and the fin up in the air with maximum steering. Once the lift decays over the tail and it drops to the ground, pull the stick hard back, so the tail drops on, now ease the stick hard back into your mum, tummy to load up the tail skid and help to bring that center of contact with the ground further off to make the aircraft more stable. And whatever you do, do not relax, Keep steering away with that rudder, keep the aircraft straight until she fully comes to a halt. Again, you can then taxi the aircraft away. If there's a very strong breeze and you're worried about the aircraft blowing over and there have been a significant number of instances where the aeroplane's landed in a strong wind, the guy turns the other wind, the wing gets up under the wings and turns the whole aeroplane over on its back. Much safer to cleave the aircraft into wind and get some ground help. If you're absolutely on your own and there's no ground help and you've got a folding wing aircraft, it's probably a good time to switch off, hop round and fold the wings up. Once the wings are folded, the aircraft isn't going to blow away. 